Well, good morning, everybody, to Friday before Memorial Day. This morning, we're going to be providing updates on uh, the legislation that has come out from the governor's office. We have our own Jenny Crittenton, who's a board of director for Retail Alliance, as well as chair of our legislative committee, will be giving us an update on the COVID-19 or the reopening guidelines. We also have with us Misty. Uh, she will also be giving us an update on the PPP loans as well. I assume, Misty, uh, from Pixel Accounting, the forgiveness applications. I know that we received our forgiveness applications, and we're going through that as well. So as we prepare to reopen, we also have with us this morning another board of director, uh, Lori Yonke. She is going to... Uh, give us an update on employees, uh, HR. She's an expert on HR, and she's gonna walk us through the reopen process as it relates to our staff. So with that, I'm gonna start off with uh, Jenny Crittenton. Jenny. Good morning. Hope you all are doing well, and um, a happy early Memorial Day weekend. Hopefully the weather will improve. Um, so basically right now, as everyone knows, we have entered the phase one guidelines, unless you're living in Northern Virginia or the city of Richmond or somewhere on the Eastern shore, um, you have been um, held back to what I'm calling ground zero. So um, too bad for those locations and hopefully they're going to move into phase one themselves soon. So phase one, I'm gonna take a moment and Kylie is going to share on the screen as we walk through this, but let's start with the guidelines in essence for just all business sectors. If you go to the um, Forward Virginia webpage on the governor's site, it's really pretty easy to click and find the general guidelines as well as um, each in, of your industry sectors that you may want to take a closer look at or you should. But let's start first with the, the guidelines for all business sectors. Um, one of the biggest things that's in place is obviously physical distancing and that is what you have to establish between your employees as well as what you have to encourage and um, implement with the public when they are inside of your business. Um, you also have to have very clear communication and signage. So making sure you've got two kinds of signage, um, one being that if you've experienced COVID-19 symptoms or been around someone with COVID-19 that you were not to enter the establishment. That's one sign. And then the other one is again related to the physical distancing. Remind people to stay six feet apart. If you are a business that has a checkout counter of sorts, you need to demarcate on the floor um, six feet distancing and encourage people to um, stay six feet apart. Um, some stores, such as grocery stores, are even implementing uh, one-way traffic paths so that, you know, you're not crossing um, less than six feet with someone. It just kind of stinks if your coffee was on aisle one, you find yourself on aisle 10. And now you've got to go back around and get that. But um, we're definitely um, seeing that as well. Um, wearing of mask. Um, it's not mandated by the governor for the public look to wear mask, but it is heavily encouraged, but it is mandated for your employees that are front facing with anyone in the public that they must be wearing a mask at all times. So if you've got someone in the back room, they don't have to, um, we would still encourage it, but it is under the um, requirements for, for pretty much all businesses that if you are within six feet of somebody working with them, you must have one on. So keep that in mind. Um, gathering, so if you're an office or you're a retail business and you'd like to have your team meetings um, on a Monday morning, they're really encouraging trying not to do that or to do that virtually maybe before you get to work or if you do it, you're doing it six feet apart in a much larger room and of no more than, than 10 people. So those are some very general things. They still want you to telework, We've gone from stay at home to you're safer at home. So if you are someone who um, is at risk or has some underlying health conditions, they're still saying as an employer, we would, we would request that you, you know, ask your employees to still, to still stay home. Um, enhanced cleaning and disinfection. Um, that certainly is another one. 
So when we get into looking at this, there are CDC guidelines as well as EPA approved disinfectants that are to be used. You can see on the sheet in front of you that you can certainly click to find those. And um, some of them are a little difficult maybe to understand because they're chemical names of sorts, um, but then some you'll, you'll recognize as um, everyday products that you would be able to buy on the shelf. One of the things that we are seeing and I would encourage you to do, particularly if you're a small retailer and you're having difficulty um, finding some of these products is to reach out to your local brewery, your um, local restaurants and see if they are buying in bulk and if there's a way that you could potentially share in that purchase if you're having difficulty finding it at the nearby you know, Walmart or, or grocery store or wherever you may be going. Um, some other things they, they talk about wanting to do is obviously washing hands um, for 20 seconds. They want you to be able to use products of you know 60% alcohol or more. Staff scheduling, they, they would prefer you to see you staff people on the same shift, like in a cohort type staffing, um, instead of staggering your, your staffing with different people, just in case someone did get sick, you now have only potentially um, exposed a smaller, smaller group of people. So just, you know, using some good common sense and best hygiene and just wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands, and um, also place hand sanitizer at the entrances and exits to your store. And if you have a cash register, I would probably also put it, put it there as well. Um, when we dive into the industry specifics, there are requirements and there are best practices. And then there's even some, some recommendations beyond best practices. And I can see where we can start um, with our restaurant, restaurants and dining. Um, I don't know about y'all, but our brewery was thrilled to be able to open his patio. And I believe they were a bit overrun with people ready to get out of the house. So just remember that there are mandatory requirements and you don't wanna find yourself in a position of getting a warning and then getting a fine. So pay attention to those. Again, we go back to the signage um, that we talked about earlier. Your occupancy is 50% less of what you can have, but also doing six feet in between tables. So in some cases, that will reduce you below the 50%. Some of the things we've recommended were reservation systems um, so that you don't become overrun with people waiting in line outside that you're trying to manage who just were ready to get out of the house and want to come out and socialize a bit. Reservation systems will help manage that. Um, there are some places that even have discussed uh, reservation time slots. So you may come in at six, but then you and your party have to leave at seven. And then the next party comes in so that someone's not commandeering a table um, the entire night. Again, you cannot see parties of 10 or more. It's 10 or less. And if you are um, at multiple tables, again, if you've got one of those big long shared tables and let's say it holds 12 people and you got six people on one end, you got to have another six feet before you can seat any other people. So um, think in terms of, again, always social distancing. Again, we go back to face coverings, employees, your, your servers must have those on, um, encouraging the folks who are, are actually coming to your place to wear them. Obviously, you can't eat or drink with a face covering, but they are asking that you, you wear them in, you wear them out. If you're going to be walking around, taking your pathway to the restroom, that you would you put it on as well then. Um, I, to be frank with you, I don't see people really implementing that as much as you would think, but um, it is an encouragement. You can do it through signage and you're, you're, you're covered that way. Um, there's best practices as well under, under restaurants. And again, when we look at that, the, the, there's mandatory requirements and then there are you know best practices. And so best practices under all of these, um, I've named some of them already. But, you know, read through those and um, just whatever you can implement, do, but don't go crazy with it or don't panic because you can't implement all the best practices or any of the additional guidelines. Really try initially 
to go with what is mandatory and then look at the best practices and see what you're, you're able to do within reason um, as well. So um, something else I didn't mention was um, cleaning of your, your high touch areas. So if you have a counter that is um, a hard service that people are near and touching often, that needs to be cleaned a lot. So in a restaurant situation, it's every time somebody is at that counter. If you're in a retail situation, they're recommending at least every every two hours. But if you're using iPads to check people out and they're touching styluses in between each use, um, make sure that that is, is wiped down as well. So Kyle, you wanna run over to brick and mortar? Is that next? We have farmer's markets, okay. So let's look a little bit at farmer's markets. Um, We've got a, a basically a, a retail farm market um, on on Gloucester's Main Street. They're still doing curbside pickup. Um, they they haven't really gotten into the delivery option, but you can call and tell them what you want, and you can come pick it up. And again, we go back to signage. Um, there was a question during the press conference on Wednesday, even about outdoor flea markets and and things of that nature. And they're just saying, you know, let's just anything that you don't think really is identified in the guidelines, go back to those original all sector business guidelines and implement from that nature. Um, with your farmers markets, again, um, a lot of this is the same thing with face coverings and hand sanitizer um, and disinfecting behind people as much as you can, and then the best practices um, as well. So brick and mortar retail, um, we were just talking a little bit about that. A lot of these are the same across the board. Again, 50% occupancy. So some of the larger brick and mortar, mortar retail that have been closed are now reopening. I know up our way, I think the TJ Maxx and the Alto were finally opening um, as of maybe yesterday. And whereas our small brick and mortar retail have been able to and have chosen to stay open the entire time um, adhering to the social distancing. But even now, it's, it's kind of odd. You go from, you can be open with um, 10 people or less. Now you can go to 50% occupancy, but now you have very specific cleaning measures. You have specific face coverings for those who are working directly with the public. If you have people in your store, you have to make sure they're staying, you know, six feet apart, no self-service food, um, mm -hmm. anything like that. So if you're someone who was a gourmet market and you were doing free samples, um, do not do that right now. You are not allowed to do that. So again, um, a lot of these are the same, looking at mandatory, looking at best practices and stick to those mandatory requirements. So let's see here, fitness and exercise facilities. Um, this was probably the group that was um, the most upset about phase one guidelines. Um, these were the folks who said, why can we not be open? We can dedicate people to, to cleaning in between equipment. We um, wanna be able to be responsible and do the same thing that retail is doing and restaurants are doing, and, and that was a no. <laughs> so um, what a lot of them are able to do, and we're starting to see it, is that they are able to hold outdoor classes. Um, but interesting enough, their social distancing within those classes are now 10 feet, not six feet. So this is the only sector, to my knowledge, that went from six feet to 10 feet. Why? I do not know. Um, I did not see that until these were, were put out. So this was all new to me as well. Um, we have a YMCA right next to my office. Um, we're allowing them to use space beside us. Um, that's a grassy area outside so that they can hold classes. I know we have, um, in our own downtown, we have a free outdoor fitness platform called Downtown Fit. We have been um, looking at holding classes outside. We've just done a poll online. We're going to be doing some yoga and some boot camp just to get people outside. But ourselves, we're going to have to be out there making sure people are 10 feet apart and adhering to it, but just giving them a chance um, to get some exercise. Again, if you're interacting with the public, face coverings, it's the same thing across the board.
Okay, so our last sector we'll talk about today is our personal care and personal grooming. So think if you're a salon or you're a massage therapist, um, tanning salons, you've really been waiting to get that tattoo, now you can, <laughs> and, um, but you have to do it a certain way. And again, we're into phase one guidelines with this. And um, these, these folks definitely are also paying strong attention to industry standards that are coming down aside from the state mandated guidelines. And in most cases, if you're probably a salon or a barber shop or a massage center, you specifically probably are adhering to even some stronger guidelines than what you're seeing um, in front of you. So making sure that if you've got specific certifications um, related to your industry, that you're paying attention to those guidelines and you're comparing them. Um, breweries, honestly, has been the same way. Um, they have seen, and, and actually the NRF even put out um, some brick and mortar guidelines. So just taking those and comparing them, you're going to see a lot of overlap, but um, making sure if you have a certification that is definitively tied to making sure that you are adhering to these new guidelines that you are doing it. Um, with, this is the only sector that the person who is coming for the appointment, so think I'm gonna get my hair done, I have to keep a mask on. Um, and all the other ones we've talked about, no one is making the public keep their mask on. But in this case, they have to. Um, if there is a particular service that you want to perform on someone that requires someone to take off the mask, you cannot do it. So that's um, something to pay attention to, staggering the stations six feet apart, Again, that 50% occupancy, your signage, washing your hands, those face coverings, et cetera. And that gives you guys a good, a good walkthrough. Um, but again, on this website, it's, it's, it's line, outlined pretty, pretty clearly what you can and, and cannot do. And, um just to follow up, Jenny, thank you so much for that. Uh, we're, Retail Alliance is also posting this on our website, Kylie, correct? You're muted, Kylie. Sorry, I was unsharing. <laughs> so yes, it's on our website under the coronavirus um, resources. Okay, and as we, as we go, Jenny, through these, these different phases, um, we will continue to, to uh, educate our, our members on what's going to be necessary and, and how the new got, newer guidelines are going to uh, roll out. Absolutely. And as we do hopefully get to phase two soon, um, we will be directly, I have, ha I have no problem directly communicating um, with the governor's staff with, with questions. I've been doing that throughout the process. It probably is a bit of a pain to them, but um, you know, sometimes there is a question that's just not been addressed and we need an answer. Um, we had one last week related to, to breweries, whereas in the very beginning, you could come by and get a growler and refill your growler and take it with you. You can't do that now. Um, so it was like a step back. So you can come buy a new one, but you couldn't refill yours. And so we had to send some very specific questions related to that. And I'm, I was looking for some explanations. I didn't get it. I just got to know. So, um, but I don't mind asking. So. Do you have any sense of when possibly the phase two will, will come in? Um, from Wednesday's press conference, the numbers are trending down. And I know he said phase one, we would be in for two to three weeks, maybe four. My, my hope is three, but I think we're going to have to see how things go, um, particularly like you and I spoke earlier with the beaches opening this weekend. I think he's going to be looking to see how responsible are people, are they going to quote unquote, I guess, behave a little bit. And if everybody is self um, responsible and doing what they're supposed to, then hopefully maybe we can move forward. If the numbers continue to trend down, um, certainly the sooner we open, the better. Do you have a sense 
of what type, what guidelines might be uh, lifted? Or I think you'll see capacity guidelines lifted. Um, so think right now where you've got um, 10 or less people at a gathering. So if you were having a party at your house, um, that may go up to 50 um, people or, so I think you may see that. Um, I do think you'll see fitness and gyms, um, don't hold me to it, but I believe you'll see those in phase two go to that 50% capacity inside that we're seeing now with, um, with brick and mortar. I don't know how much will change with brick and mortar, but maybe with restaurants in phase two, you potentially would see a 50% capacity now inside with that six foot distancing between tables. So it, it's gonna creep, creep, creep. Um, so we'll see. He says, this, the governor says it's not a regional, but however, he's making some regional decisions, it appears, with Northern Virginia, yeah. Virginia Beach. Um, do you see that increasing as maybe the, the, uh, the amount of cases in one region of the state is less than in a more populous? Do you see him adjusting that stance? From what I can gather, Ray, it seems to be the conversations between the leaders in each of those locales. Um, I know in that Northern Virginia area and then the city of Richmond, um, it basically came from what I'm understanding from those local leaders who said, hey, we don't think we should go into phase one. And so he says, okay, <laughs> they have the right to do that. I, I wish we also would give the right, um, and this is getting a bit political, sorry. Um, and Kylie's like, don't get political. <laughs> but I wish that we also had the same right within certain locales that if there are limited numbers and you're in a rural area and your local leaders believe you, you could potentially go to the next phase that you could, but they're not allowing us to go in reverse or, or go forward. They're only allowing you to, to hold hold that growth back as far as opening. So that's just where we sit. Do you, do you have any sense being on the task force, the um, if the numbers of testing is gonna be dramatically increased? Because we were one of the last in the country as, in far, as far as testing our population. Do you, do you, have a sense of, of it's going to be more open, it's going to be drive ups, uh, things of that nature. I think we're going to certainly see it more available. Um, he definitely talked about that on Wednesday. Um, it's interesting, just yesterday, my, my mom got the antibody test um, because we had gotten a phone call from a friend of ours who I had seen two days prior whose son was exhibiting some symptoms. And so he was being tested and she needed to notify us. I mean, I think he's fine, but you, you, anybody who's had remotely any kind of symptoms, they're starting to have accessibility to testing. And so the testing numbers are, are, are going up and you know that's why they're looking at percentages. So instead of saying we have this many cases, which they're still reporting, it's more so based on if we were this percentage of growth in um, positive cases or we're trending down or we're, we're flattening, flattening that curve. When we are starting to trend down, in the percentage that are positive. So that's good news. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you so much for uh, going through each of the guidelines. And You're welcome. Next week, as we move into a, well, next couple of weeks, as we yeah. move to a, a, a new phase, we can address those new guidelines as well. Uh, we're very fortunate to have you part of this call. So thank you. I don't see any chats on here, Joey as far as the guidelines pertaining to the reopening or moving Virginia forward. So with that, I think we'll move on. Um, we have Misty Leinberger of Pixel Financial Group with us. She's been with us for the last several um, COVID-19 briefings, and she's gonna walk us through the, well, maybe not only just the PPP, Misty, but now the forgiveness applications are out there and people are starting to, to fill those out. So, Mr. Right. 
So I'm so sorry I missed last week because last week my plan was to go over what you need to be doing to maximize the forgiveness of the PPP loan. Um, so I'm going to start with that first. And what's important to know is that you don't want to, I, I realize the applications are out there to apply for this forgiveness. And I definitely recommend that you go and get them so that you can start making sure you have all of your paperwork in place, but you don't actually want to apply for it until you have the money spent. And I know there have been a lot of questions about how long you have to spend this money. And you know, you hear a lot of eight weeks, eight weeks. And the answer is it's eight weeks from when you receive it up to, do, to June 30th of this year. The PPP uh, loans were intended to cover expenses from February 15th of this year through June 30th of this year. And a lot of people are like, are asking me, well, I just received my PPP, I don't have eight weeks. But it is retroactive to expenses back to February 15th of 2020. So we're working with a lot of our clients to make sure that they're applying this money. For example, a lot of our business owners actually took their own personal funds and put them into the business in order to cover payroll, or, you know, mostly payroll. And so we're working with them to retroactively apply these PPP funds back to February 15th so that they stay in compliance. Um, I know a lot of people have also received both the PPP and the EIDL loans. And our recommendation is to make sure that you, of course, the rule is no less than 75% of this, at least 75% of this loan has to be applied towards payroll. And if you're receiving both the EIDL, and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, as well as the PPP, our recommendation for most of our clients is to use the PPP exclusively for payroll if you know if we can make that happen and then use the EIDL for operating expenses just so that we don't run into um, maybe overusing it for non-payroll related items. The other thing you need to remember with the PPP in terms of forgiveness is it's not intended to cover FICA FUDA. So the employer portion of federal taxes is not covered by the PPP and will not be forgiven. So you still need to use your regular operating funds in order to cover the employer federal portion of those. It does cover state and local uh, payroll taxes though, so you're fine there. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can be doing to maximize for the forgiveness and get the money spent by June 30th and then apply for that PPP, but you want to spend it first. And again, I've been saying through this entire thing that you cannot document enough for this. It's another reason why I think using it just for PP or for payroll purposes is a great idea because you have payroll reports that make this a lot easier to document than pulling out your lease agreements or having to save all of your receipts, which of course I recommend every, you know, anyway, um, but if you're using it for non-income related expenses, keep in mind that that's only for debt interest. So mortgage interest, credit card interest, line of credit interest. So you're gonna need to be able to provide statements showing that you only spent that money on the interest portion of those, not the principal portion. So be working really, really hard to make sure that you are maximizing the forgiveness of this. And then once the money is spent, you're going to apply for the forgiveness and you're gonna be working with your bank, whatever individual bank uh, processed your loan, you're gonna be working with them. Um, now the other question here is that uh, somebody's talking about furloughed employees and this has been a major question for a lot of small business owners for a lot of different reasons. Um, I know a lot of small business owners are working with people who, um, are honestly getting more money on unemployment than they would be on payroll, or they have refused to come back to work for one reason or another, or they were terminated with cause. Now, the Small Business Administration has, in some cases, said that they're not going to penalize employers in terms of forgiveness based on a reasonable cause. Now, they haven't exactly been super detailed about what the reasonable cause is going to be, although they have said is just make sure you document. So I have actually been having employers call their, your, you know, my, my clients call their employees and essentially give them an offer letter that says, hey, we have the PPP loan, we're ready to bring you back on payroll. If the employees refuse, then we have documentation that they were asked to come back and refused to come back. The employees also need to know that this could affect their unemployment benefits. So if they are offered their job back or asked to come back and they refuse to do so um, for any reason that is not acceptable, and there are some reasons that are, that are acceptable for an employee not to come back to work uh, in terms of FMLA, uh, but 
for example, I have one employer that just said, well, my employee's scared of COVID, so they don't want to come back. Unfortunately, that's not being scared of COVID isn't really covered under a reason not to go back to work. So my recommendation to them is to simply document that to the best of their ability. They can hire somebody in place of that employee, although I know a lot of employers are actually having a hard time hiring people, which is amazing to me, but it's true. So just the best I can tell you here is to document as best as you can. And again, the SVA says they're not going to penalize employers for situations like that. But again, you need to have the documentation and they haven't been super detailed about that. Now, in terms of the EIDL loan, um, people are starting to see the money from that. And if you remember, there were a lot of rumors in the beginning about how this was going to be capped at $15,000 or capped at $25,000. But I have a couple of uh, clients who've received upwards of over $100,000 in the EIDL. So the rumor mill uh, surrounding the EIDLs is, is not really supporting what's actually happening out there. The one thing that I would uh, remind people is that so far the EIDLs I've seen approved have been very, very, very generous. And it's almost scary to a point. They don't really want all that money. You do not have to take all of that money. This is simply an initial offer and you can go back to the SBA and say, really, I only want this much money. So you don't have to take all of that money. So keep that in mind as well. Um, of course, there are the payroll tax credits that you're going to be able to take advantage of. There's the employee retention credit, keeping in mind that you cannot use the employee retention credit in conjunction with the PPP. It's one or the other. So hopefully you are talking with your tax professionals, your CPAs, about what is the best um, move for you. Of course, if you already have the PPP and did not pay it back by May 14th, you're stuck with the PPP. So just know that. Um, and that anything that isn't forgiven is going to be paid off in two years at 1% interest. So just a reminder on that one as well. Now, the EIDLs, the handful I have seen so far, the terms have been the 3.75% interest over 30 years. And that's primarily because the size of the loans coming in would warrant a 30 year loan. So just keep in mind that that 10 to 30 years that they said it was going to be, so far I haven't seen a 10 year loan. I have seen only 30 year uh, terms come out. So uh, that's a kind of a big deal there. It does spread things out. It's a little bit scary for some of our clients. Uh, but again, I think that gives them a lot of flexibility. Now there is also the uh, leave, the paid leave, uh, employer tax credit for the FMLA provisions of COVID-19. Uh, it's been difficult for me to do a video lately, but that's something I'm going to be doing a video about here very soon. There are about six reasons that the COVID-19 paid leave is to be paid off. Um, this is for companies that have fewer than 500 employees, although if you have 50 or less and this is going to have uh, an undue financial burden on you, you can apply for exemption of having to pay this leave. But essentially it's for employees who have either contracted it, have been advised to quarantine themselves, um, can't go to work because of a government order, or are caring for somebody who may have the disease, or they're for some reason they can't work because their childcare or their dependent care is no longer available for, for them and some other similar situations you'll be able to pay them the leave with a 100% reimbursement that you can start taking advantage of sooner, like pretty much immediately when you are filing your 941s. And the way that works is hopefully you are working with your payroll providers to make sure you have the right codes in place. And um, while they're filing your 941s, they're aware of how this is going to work. But essentially when you're filing your 941s, you simply won't pay the employer portion of the federal income taxes. Instead, it's you're, you're using your credit. If you are unable to use all of the credit to which you are entitled, you will be able to file what's called a Form 7200 to request a refund for the remainder. So be working very closely with your payroll providers. As far as I can tell, all the payroll providers that I'm aware of have done a fantastic job of getting the system in place. So if you haven't already talked to them, talk to them now. The other thing is, is that the COVID-19 FMLA paid leave cannot be used in conjunction with the PPP. So your PPP loan funds cannot be used for this COVID-19 related leave in which you will be reimbursed 100%. So that is something that you really need to keep in mind moving forward. I don't know how many of you are affected by this. I have a few clients who have been 
affected uh, by this. So just make sure you keep that in mind that the PPP funds are not for the COVID-19 related leave. Um, and I think that pretty much covers that. Laura, you said yours was six months of operating expenses for the idle at 30 years. So um, that's, that's pretty good. I, I actually think this is gonna be a great opportunity for a lot of small businesses in terms of the EIDL loans um, to, get, to keep, not only keep their companies on track, but to get back on track, so. So I understand, Misty, that with the EIDL loans, there is a portion of that, or there's two different types of loans. One's a grant, that is forgivable, and then the other is an actual loan that has to be paid back, correct? Well, the grant is not, it's not that it's forgivable, it's just that you don't have to pay it back. You're, so a lot of people, the SBA very quietly deposited money into people's accounts, um, and they didn't hear anything until a couple of weeks later, and that was the grant portion. That was clearly where they were starting to process their loan, and they quietly deposited that money. The grant does not have to be paid back. Now, essentially what the grant is, is an advance of the loan. Um, so I am still trying to determine, there's like, I can't seem to quite get the answer is, is this in addition to the loan or is it an advance of the loan? And when I'm reading stuff, uh, I see both sides of that story. So if anybody who has received the loan sees that the money you've received is less the grant, I would really love to know that so I could have that answer in stone for sure. So. And there was a, um, a rumor out there I don't, that you could not apply for the EIDL loan and the PPP loan. No, you can apply for both. But what you need to know is that if you receive the grant, let's say, um, I think the average grant I've seen come in has been $5,000 and you have a 20,000 PPP and assuming it's 100% forgivable. Well, that $5,000 is going to reduce the forgivability of the PPP. So they're not letting you have PPP and grant money. So mm -hmm. what'll happen is your PPP will only be forgivable for $15,000. So essentially it's like paying the grant money back because that $5,000 will be paid off over two years at 1%. So you can have both, but you've got to make sure that you can manage the cash flow of that if you're going to take both. The other thing is, is you can, re I know several of my clients are taking the grant, but they're not taking the loan. They've decided, you know what, the grant was enough to get us through this rough patch. I don't really want a loan that I have to pay off over 30 years. I'm just not gonna take the loan. And you can do that and you can still keep the grant money, keeping in mind that they also have PPPs in which it will reduce its forgiveness. That's important for everybody to know because yes. there is a misconception out there. I also heard that, uh, Misty, maybe you, you can address this, that in the next stimulus package that is, that's being negotiated now, that they are going to be adjusting the percentages that has to be allotted to payroll as opposed to just operating expenses. Have you heard anything about that? I haven't. Uh, I've been taking care of a personal family emergency, uh, so I haven't really been on the news as much trying to keep track of that. But there is one thing I do want to bring up, and that is um, a few weeks ago, I think almost a month ago, I was on here and I had mentioned that the funds that you use, like the expenses that you pay using the PPP loans, we would we have received guidance that those expenses will not be deductible for business purposes. However, and that was huge because it could significantly undermines whether or not the forgiveness is taxable or not. So um, there is a bill that has been submitted to make it so that we can use those funds as deductible expenses. So just FYI, everybody, it's ex I figured that was gonna happen. There isn't any news as to whether that has passed or not. I'm, I'm hoping and assuming that it's going to. So just something to keep our eyes on is whether or not we're actually going to be able to deduct the expenses that we use the PPP funds on for, uh, for tax purposes. Because right now the guidance is no. Well, thank you so much, Misty. And again, I remind everybody, if you have a question for Misty or any of our speakers, please, please uh, enter that into the chat room. And we do have a, a comment question from Carl Bland. Yeah. We've so, heard the first 25,000 of the EIDL is not collateralized. Does it is not, concern? not the first 25. Um, after that, they will ask for collateral. Uh, if you don't have any, 
from what I understand with my conversations with the SBA, that's not going to be the end all be all. They're not going to deny your loan based on collateral alone. Up to 200,000, you will not have to personally vouch for it. And then after that point, you would. Um, I don't know anybody who has actually received any more than about $180,000 up to this point, but, um, but up to 25 is unsecured. Okay, um, again, we'll, as we always recommend, work closely with your, your banker to help guide you through this process, as well as your accountant for that matter. So with uh, no other questions, I wanna thank you again, Misty. Thank you so much and- um, I had a question. <laughs> okay. I just put it in the chat. Did you not see it? I did not. Um, Go ahead and ask your question. Okay, I received both the um, EIDL grant and the PPP. I understand that the EID will have to eventually pay back in two years, but Mr. You indicated that in fact it will be reduce my forgivability from the PPP loan. So that, you know, I was thinking, oh, I'd like to just keep that money for two years just for a rainy day and pay it back at 1% interest. But are they going to reduce what I get back from the PPP forgivability instead? So, so it reduces the forget so the EIDL grant, not the entire EIDL loan, yeah, the but grant, just the grant. grant portion of it reduces your the forgiveness of your PPP. So, like I was saying, let's say you received five thousand dollars for an EIDL grant, and you have a twenty thousand dollar PPP. Only fifteen thousand dollars of the PPP will now be forgivable because you have the five thousand dollar grant. So it reduces the forgiveness of that PPP. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Sarah, for that question. Um, I just want to um, ask, Misty, following on from that, if you don't use the grant portion of it by a certain date, will it roll over into being a loan on the 1% and then will it not take away from the PPP forgiveness part of it? Not that I'm aware of. I think the, the grant, they want you to use it for things like payroll and operating expenses. Um, but as far as I know, the, the, the grant doesn't roll over into anything. It's simply you received this grant, you do not have to pay it back. Um, you know, you don't even have to take the EIDL loan, but it does reduce the forgivability of the PPP. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Thank you, Misty. And without any other questions, we'll move on to our next uh, guest speaker. We're very fortunate to have Lori Yonke who is owner of Left and Right Enterprises, Inc., which is actually the owner of Once Upon a Child, as well as Plato's Palace. Not only is she a successful retailer, but she's also an employment or HR human resources expert. So she's gonna talk about what she's doing to ensure her reopening goes as smoothly as possible. And as that HR expert, Lori has created several documents and flyers to help guide businesses during this process. So thank you, Lori. And again, I remind everybody to please feel free to ask questions on your chat uh, or raise your hand and, and we will uh, feel those questions as we go. Lori? Good morning, thank you, Ray. So just one correction. We have uh, Once Upon a Child and Closed Mentor in Newport News. Uh, we did used to have a Plato's Closet up in Mechanicsville, but we sold that business. So uh, thank you for inviting me to speak today. I was speaking with um, Kylie and Joey actually on another topic when the reopening came up and I just started sharing with them what we had put together in our businesses and we thought it would be helpful um, if we made this available for everyone. So you can, uh, you can take it or you can leave it, but what I wanted to share with you was the approach that we have taken uh, to make sure that we're compliant. So let me start by saying our businesses never had to close. Uh, so we were very fortunate. Now we were impacted by the limit of 10 customers and the reality was customers just weren't out. So we, we joked all through the, the ground zero phase, I think as Jenny called it, um, that we would have loved to have had more than 10 customers <laughs> trying to come into the store at one time. But now we are seeing customer traffic pick up. So I wanted to share with you our approach and our resources. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, 
we know that there are opinions all over the spectrum about how serious this is and what the impact's going to be. But as uh, a team, I have two, I should share, I have two co-owners in my businesses. So as a team, we just decided we want to hope for the best, but we have to plan for the worst. And that's the approach that we took. We just said there's a lot of unknowns related to this, but in terms of keeping our people and our customers safe, we think we have to plan for the worst case scenario. And that's the approach that we took. And the funny part is right now we're in this phase that feels very foreign to retailers where we have to say that right now volume is dictated by safety. And under normal conditions, we all know we're all about volume all the time, but we feel like at least for the next 12 to 18 months, we've had to agree to say safety has to be number one. And if that impacts volume slightly, we have to accept that because the reality is if we don't get this right, and something happens in our business, we could be shut down um, for two weeks or more, and then our volume is zero. So the first thing that we wanted to look at was how do we prevent and minimize any possible exposure or spread of coronavirus or any virus uh, for that matter at this point? So what I'm gonna share with you today is very high level. We can certainly talk through questions, but I've shared very specific tools and plans with Retail Alliance that they can make available to you if you're interested. But the first conversation that we had is how do we update our operations to include the physical distancing requirements and frequent cleaning? So some of the things that we looked at were um, not allowing any associates who are demonstrating any symptom of COVID-19 to work. Um, and that gets tricky because some of those symptoms are headache, sore throat. But the reality is right now, if you come in and say you have a headache, we are sending you home because we just can't risk it. So if associates are sick, they need to stay home. Um, we have had to go through each step of our operations to look at how we maintain social distancing. And in the instances, we have one part of our operations where no matter how we reconfigure or do it, we couldn't get six feet. So we built the sneeze guards, the plexiglass sneeze guards between the associates um, as an additional protection. Um, associates are supposed to be avoiding any type of physical contact with each other. So handshakes, high fives, hugs, any of those things that our team members would normally do. Uh, this is an interesting one. We were looking at ways to completely eliminate handling paperwork. So paper handoffs is one of these areas where you can potentially spread the virus. So we went through each step of operations to figure out how do we minimize that, even down to where it's not paper, but credit card machines. How do we set up a credit card transaction if you don't have a machine? In one of our stores, we have a machine that we don't have to touch, but in another, we still have to touch it. So it was putting things in place to minimize touching and handoffs of machines. Um, as the cleaning requirements uh, dictate, we do have to frequently write down surfaces um, with approved materials. The approved materials are becoming a challenge. Um, so part of what I've provided is the, uh, the guidance from CDC and OSHA on how we mix our own, but you know, we've just kind of told people, if you're shopping and you see bleach, get it for us. If you're shopping and you see these things, get it for us. Uh, and that's part of the way that we're trying to mitigate that. Um, someone asked if we are accepting cash. Uh, we would prefer not to, but we are. What we have done for cash transactions is we have our associates put on gloves uh, for the cash transaction and then throw those gloves away. Um, but yeah, our, our dream would be uh, to get everybody going either card or, I mean, the ideal is Apple Pay or Google Pay or any of those other touchless transactions, uh, but we are still accepting cash just because we don't want to lose those transactions. Um, we have posted additional signage in our bathrooms in English and Spanish, just reminding people to, to wash their hands. Uh, as Jenny said, we had to go through and put all of the six foot marking at cash wraps and throughout the store. And then we did reposition some of our work areas just to make sure um, that the distancing was in place. So that was really kind of the first step was how do we put these prevention and minimization efforts in? So it was go through operations, literally walk it, walk the process and figure out where you're touching things or handing things off or too close to one another. Um, the next was 
making sure we were clear on what the new cleaning routine is and ensuring we had the right cleaning materials as well as the PPP for those that have to use it. So one of the um, bricks and mortar requirements, I believe, I can't remember if it's requirement or best practice, we thought it was a requirement. If you have shopping carts, is that you have to have someone sanitizing shopping carts at all times. So every time they come in or go out, they have to be sanitized. That's one area in this process where we've struggled with the physical distancing aspect of it, but we're doing our best just to ask people to, to wait for the cart to be wiped down, then our person walks away, they come and get it, and that person goes back. Um, in addition to that, we have increased the routine cleaning of any high traffic area or high touch area. We're doing those every two hours. And we have a sanitation checklist that the associates have to sign to acknowledge they've done those cleanings. Uh, the reason I say that is the um, attorneys are lining up to start <laughs> suing businesses that don't adequately pr uh, protect the public where there could be an outbreak or an exposure. Now, I know there are bills being introduced that could potentially limit some of that liability, but they're not in place today. So we just wanna make sure we have documentation in place to say, we can confirm this happened. Here's our video of it happening. Here's the signed um, checklist. Now, the signed checklist is paper. So it's one of those times where you know, we want to eliminate paper, but in that instance, we just said for protection, we're going to keep that one. And then obviously the last step in prevention and minimization is to follow all of our executive orders. Um, one of the exercises we did that we found really helpful, and this is honestly the approach we're taking, you know, one of the tricky things with coronavirus and COVID-19 is you can be asymptomatic and be sick and you're spreading it and you're exposing it to others and you don't know. So what we said was we need to structure our operations and assume every team member and every customer that walks through the door is contagious. How do we then operate the store and prevent and minimize their ability to make our team members sick or other customers sick? And that's what kind of helped us in this exercise. So that's how we took um, our approach to prevention and minimization. And I've got, again, some documentation on this that you can get from Retail Alliance if you're uh, interested. Uh, so a question came in through the, the chat about, are we considering taking temperatures? We are not as a rule, unless we're required by law to do it. And the reason is there's a conflict between the social distancing requirement and temperature taking as a permissible activity. So the mandate today is six foot social distancing. If we take a temperature, we are not social distancing at six feet. You have to get really close to that person to take their temperature. So we, we are basically asking our associates to self-report. Um, and if they are unwell, you know, if they take a temperature before they come, if they're running a temperature to tell us, uh, we do have some instances in our exposure response where we would start taking temperatures. Uh, so I'll talk about that in a minute. But as a rule, we have not added that and we don't intend to unless we are required by an executive order to do it because of the potential exposure to the person that has to take the temperatures. Okay, so the next part gets into exposure response because our, our goal is to prevent and minimize so that we never have exposure or a positive test, but the reality is it can happen. Uh, this was not our business and this was not in Virginia, but I'll share a story from another business that I'm, I um, have a relationship with where they had an associate who was actually a driver and he was hyper vigilant at work about not getting or spreading COVID-19 to the point he brought in voluntary additional PPE. So the state requirement was cloth mask. He put on a face shield of his own doing. He was hyper vigilant at work about not doing anything to get sick and then went to his friend's house for a barbecue on the weekend and three people at that barbecue came down with COVID-19. So part of the reason we wanted to make sure we have the response in place is we can do everything right in our business, but we can't control what associates and customers do in their private lives. So we wanted to have a plan in place and this is actually a pretty lengthy document that gets into several different scenarios. So the first scenario is if someone is demonstrating symptoms of COVID-19, and we went through different scenarios. If they have symptoms and they've tested positive, this is what we do. If they have symptoms and they've tested negative, this is what we do. Uh, and then we had another bucket of if they don't have um, symptoms, but they've been tested, they're positive, they're negative, they live with someone that is, 
This document's also available to you if you'd like to use that as a reference. But uh, in the exposure response plan, the main thing is to have guidelines established that deal with a confirmed exposure and positive tests. Uh, because as employers, we do have some requirements. If, if one of our people tests positive, we have very specific requirements for what we have to do before we can be open again. Uh, and there's some reporting requirements we have to the CDC. So make sure you have guidelines established that deal with a, a possible exposure or a confirmed test and be completely consistent with how you apply those. Um, this is not COVID-19 related. This was actually something, gosh, Ray, it was probably three years ago we did pandemic planning on loss prevention task force. But one of the things that stuck with me, so this was just for regular cough cold flu season, was to plan for 30% of your staff to be out at all times due to illness or caring for people that are sick. So we've just decided to make that our new normal. Um, so that does mean we're looking at getting additional staffing in place to deal with people that are out because they're either exposed or sick or childcare conflicts or any of those things that are coming up. I will echo what Misty said, and this has honestly changed in the last three weeks. Um, but we, we, like everyone else, are struggling to get people off unemployment at this point. Uh, so hiring is a challenge, and I don't have <laughs> a magic bullet for that because we can't pay what unemployment's paying because I think if I'm doing the math right, it's coming out to about $23 to $25 an hour um, in Virginia right now. Uh, but we are, in terms of workforce planning and scheduling, saying let's assume 30 people call in, 30% call in sick every day. How do we staff the store with that? Uh, so with the temperature taking in our um, response plan, there are some instances where we would start taking temperature. So if an, if an associate informs us that they've had an exposure to COVID-19, but they have tested negative, uh, we do have a quarantine period for them, but we would then do temperature checks on everyone on the team for two weeks because someone confirmed to us that they had exposure. Uh, if someone tests positive, um, once we go through the initial stuff in the response, we would then do temperature checks for two weeks on all other associates because someone had been positive. But those are really the two instances, unless we are required to do it, where we would um, begin temperature checks. So as I said, there's a sample exposure response plan for you that you can reference and use if you like. Uh, I will mention the guidance is literally changing all the time. Um, so we've already updated our exposure plan probably four times based on quarantine periods that are recommended by the CDC. Uh, the one that changed the most recently is for people who have, who are demonstrating symptoms but have tested negative. That quarantine period used to be recommended to be seven days. Well, it's actually symptom-free without over-the-counter medication for 72 hours after a minimum of a seven-day quarantine. That's actually changed to 10 days at this point. Uh, and I think, uh, this is me speculating, but I think that's due to the amount of false positives uh, that are happening with the test. But we've got that outlined in the um, response plan. I just wanna mention, if you use our template, you do have to watch the guidance. Uh, someone asked where we purchased our temperature tools, and I believe they came off of Amazon. Uh, we just got an infrared thermometer off of Amazon. Okay, last slide. And this is just the items that we've made available to Retail Alliance that you can reference and use for your businesses. So we've put together high level social distancing operational guidelines, sample exposure plan, uh, the environmental cleaning and disinfecting requirements and the sanitation checklist. One thing that I will add to the um, exposure plan that we are using is any associate who is out for five consecutive calendar days has to be, they have to complete a health screening before they return to work. Um, and we just go down and ask a number of questions tied to things on our exposure plan that would trigger some type of quarantine or time away from work. Um, so we are doing that and I'll make that available um, as well. But if people are working in with us every day, we feel like we kind of have a, an idea for how they're doing. But if someone's out, and again, that's an arbitrary number we just had to pick. We didn't want to screen people every day, but we wanted to pick a number where we felt like they've been away long enough that something could have happened. So we chose five consecutive calendar days, and they just have to do the rescreening the day before they come back. Lori, um, so <laughs> hypothetically, if someone 
comes down with the virus, a member of your staff, and they've been working mm -hmm. obviously with your staff as well as your customers, you could mm -hmm. hypothetically quarantine everybody in your store, right? And then would you be contacting the customers? So that's a good question. So um, by our exposure plan, if we have an associate who tests positive, it depends on whether they were showing symptoms at work or whether they were not showing symptoms at work. So we'll, I'll talk through both scenarios. If they were showing symptoms at work, it is, uh, it's a higher likelihood of exposure um, from what we understand with the CDC. Um, but we would, we would actually have to shut down uh, for 24 to 72 hours to clean and disinfect the entire store. So one of the things to keep in mind, especially as cleaning materials get um, sparse, the, from what we understand today, the virus is dead within 72 hours on surfaces. So if the person works, let's say in an office and they're by themselves, you could just close that door and leave it for 72 hours. Uh, if there's windows, open the windows, get air circulation. But it, within 72 hours, the virus will be dead on all of the surfaces. Um, and actually the CDC is recommending that you let the virus sit because within 24 to 72 hours, it's less likely to be active because even when we clean, we do kind of throw stuff in the air. Um, so if someone tests positive, Ray, to, to your question, if they were demonstrating symptoms at work or they weren't, we would have to inform all of our associates we would start the um, temperature screening for 14 days. I don't know how in our setting we would notify customers because we don't log them, but we would probably put a notice on the door that someone had tested positive and then these are the steps that we have taken to reopen. But a positive test would require some type of shutdown um, to ensure the, the cleaning and the sanitation that's required to, to open back up. Have you have you heard, Lori, about these sanitation uh, bombs that you can basically mm -hmm. set off in your in your building, your facility, and it mm -hmm. sanitizes the entire um, you know I I interior? Yep. So I have a, a friend. This is in Connecticut, so not Virginia. He's unfortunately he's in a manufacturing environment and has had a couple positive, that's what they're doing. They fumigate. So they go in and they put off the bomb. That has to sit for 24 hours. And then they go in the next day to clean it up and they can open the day after that. Do we have any other questions for Lori? Well, I have a couple. <laughs> so so we have, um, um, Walk us through the childcare situation from an employee standpoint, meaning that uh, mm -hmm. you know, the childcare facilities are closed, the employee can't yep. get to work. Um, so what do you do in that situation? Um, because it's covered under the CARES Act, uh, there is, so there's two options. There, there is provision under the CARES Act where they can remain on unemployment. Um, but there's also uh, this part under the, the FMLA cover where we as employers could pay it. So what we've tried to do when we're recalling associates is kind of move people from the top of the list to the bottom of the list. So if we know someone's having a challenge with childcare right now and they're receiving um, unemployment insurance, that's where we're choosing to leave them so that we don't get in this weird place of do we pay them? Do we, it's what Misty just said. Do you pay them? and then try to get the benefit for that or do you not and take the ding. Uh, we have not filed for exemptions at this point, although we would apply for it, uh, but we also haven't had anyone to date that has not returned to work because of childcare. Uh, we've had some people that said that I just don't feel safe, um, but that's what we're doing is we're kind of staggering the furloughs and if they say I'm not ready, we just drop them to the bottom of the list. Now, if we get to the bottom of the list and it's time to bring them back, then we're gonna have to make a decision on do we do the do we pay them or do we replace them? And we haven't, haven't had to make that decision yet. Well, thank you so much, Lori. Thank you for being with us. Uh, that's a wealth of information. Uh, I'm sure our guys are gonna be, you know, they're, they're gonna go through the challenges. This uh, collateral that you have uh, given to Kylie is something that we certainly will put out to our membership and it will be available to, uh, to everybody. So thank you so much for that.
I'm going to now turn it over to Kylie Seibert, our VP of Corporate Communications, to review the events and the upcoming uh, things that we're doing. Kylie? Right, I'm going to be quick because I know that people need to get to their day jobs. Um, just wanted to continue um, you know, letting people know about our face masks are still available. Uh, we are handing them out at the office, so thank you to Beth and Rhonda who have uh, Monday to Friday, 8 till 12. Um, so if any small business owner, retail, restaurant, anyone would like to go and get some masks, please do so. Also, I'd like to thank Rob Willey and Chris Smith at the Virginia Beer Company who have hosted us for the second week in a row this week and to Brenda Toosing from the Royal Chocolate who also hosted us uh, yesterday in her store in Town Centre. So next Wednesday, we have um, another distribution point on the peninsula. It's in Yorktown at the York Village Shopping Centre which is, um, we're gonna be outside Cozy Cottage there. And that will be from 12 to four next Wednesday. So we'll, that's also posted on our website um, on the face mask, face mask post. And also Tina and Beth are gonna be going out and visiting members as well. So if, uh, contact them if they're your membership director, please contact them if you have not got your masks as yet and they will arrange to drop off some to you. And we will continue until we run out. So. You know, we will let you know when that is, but we should have a long way to go and should last us for at least another month or so. Ray, anything to add for that? Otherwise, I'll just... No, I, I, we, we've, uh, we've given out over 10,000 masks. Uh, we hope to have masks getting, getting us through the summer and hopefully um, the fall. They are intended for staff, not for customers. I would like to emphasize that. Uh, our boots on the ground, Tina and Beth Cook and Teresa, uh, as well as Lisa Renee and myself for that matter, will still be, we will always have the mask with us. So as we go out and see our members, if you require more additional masks, please don't hesitate to, uh, to request them. Remember they do, uh, they are washable up to 15 times each. So uh, that's a great thing, and uh, we want to make sure that we're taking care of not only our members, but uh, all small businesses, small retailers. So mm -hmm. thank you. Anything else, Kylie? I just wanted to uh, let people know, um, well, it's not on here, but uh, next, well, the week after next, actually, we're holding um, our Strive webinar. Um, Joey, I'll hand it over to you because I haven't written the details in front of me, but we have just finalized the details for that. Um, Joey, are you able to come online for a moment? Yeah, um, June 2nd at 9 a.m. we are going to have um, Casey McCoy of Create Captivate Digital Marketing on. And what she's doing is she is doing a um, bit of a social media audit of uh, several of our members that we feel have been really great on social media with their customer interaction and uh, potential customer growth during COVID-19. And she's going to go through pick specific examples of what they've been doing and why it's working and how you can do it. And that'll be June 2nd at 9 a.m. So yeah, again, like Laura, some best practices and case studies um, of some success stories in, in how to just keep engaging your customers um, as we go through this crisis. So I've uh, written on, on the screen is the resources again, please refer to our website, please read our emails, newsletters um, for the latest information on anything, whether it's legislatively, financially, any of the events coming up. So please uh, connect with us and reach out to any one of the staff members as well if you have any questions. Uh, well, thank you, Kylie. And this really concludes our ninth COVID-19. Uh, there's been a lot of changes. There's been a lot of evolution since uh, March the 27th uh, from updating people on what the regulations were, then going through the reopen phase and the guidelines and things of that nature. It's been uh, an incredible, incredible nine weeks. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jenny Crittenton. I'd like to thank uh, Misty Leinberger, and I'd like to also thank uh, Lori Yonke for joining us today and helping our folks get through this, this challenge. Don't forget it's Memorial Day. Think about those who, who fought to help our, with our freedoms. Uh, they, they're the ones who really have uh, sacrificed their lives and they went through some incredible challenges that far outweigh this one. So we will get through this and uh, we will be successful. 
will be stronger after. So thank you again. Right. We'll Sorry. reconvene against, again next Friday, the 29th at 930 for the next uh, COVID-19 briefing.